Congratulations! If you've made it to this chapter, you have probably identified a topic so perfect it makes you weep with joy. Or you have something in mind that you're pretty sure will do the job of showcasing some of your best personal qualities while telling admissions something they don't already know about you, which is also a really good place to start. Whatever the case, it's time to turn that magical idea into a giant pile of related words, phrases, sentences, even paragraphs in the second major step of College Essay Academy's uncommon essay approach, free writing. One of the greatest misconceptions students have about the college essay, and about writing in general, is that ideas are supposed to come out of your brain and onto the page perfectly formed on the very first try. But, as with so many things in life, it often takes a few broad, messy strokes and some thoughtful refinement to create a true masterpiece. It's possible that the Declaration of Independence underwent a little revision before John Hancock put his John Hancock on it. And maybe, just maybe, Michelangelo didn't paint the Sistine Chapel in one sitting. The point is, as we told you in the last chapter, you will likely need to swim in a little word soup on your way to crafting a perfectly tailored college admissions essay. In this chapter, we're going to teach you how to do so with the freedom and abandon it takes to get some truly creative and insightful ideas down on the page. As always, we have anticipated all of your most burning questions. How do I set the mood for free writing? What is a brain dump? What does it mean to drill around and drill down? What are the rules of free writing? How do I identify patterns and pluck gems? And why is outlining my friend? We'll start by setting the mood for a successful free write. We're sure that you have mastered the daily multitasking required to check your email, scour Reddit, watch an endless stream of Snapchats, answer texts, and write the most stunning personal essay ever created all at the same time. But this is one occasion for which it is really important to escape your everyday distractions and focus. Environment is everything, and you want to do all you can to set yourself up for success. Before you sit down to start working on your essay, disconnect. Check your email, catch up on your friend's Snapchat stories, and then cut the cord. We know, you're wireless. It was a metaphor. It may sound extreme, but cutting yourself off from the internet and all the distractions that come along with it actually makes a world of difference for your concentration and creativity. If you don't trust yourself to turn off the internet and stay off of it, try using software that locks you out of your internet connection for a set period of time, or asking a trusted friend or family member to change your passwords. And don't forget to turn off your phone. Put that thing in airplane mode. Have your little sister hide it from you, if she's the kind of sister who will eventually give it back. Do whatever you have to do. You can text your super extra BFF for life in an hour or two when you take a regularly scheduled internet break. We're trying to focus you, not kill you. Find your happy place. Some students have luck working at the local library. Others need the quiet of their rooms to be truly productive. A few prefer to be locked into airtight vault and lowered into the depths of the ocean to knock out a few hours of writing. On the other hand, you could be one of those people who is inspired by noisy coffee shops and people watching, and that's fine too. Know thyself. Before you get to work, set yourself up in an environment that will truly be conducive to thinking and writing. Compartmentalize your fears. Maybe you don't think you can do this. And why would you? You've probably never done it before. That said... This may be your first time writing an admissions essay, but every day you send dozens, hundreds, millions of texts. You dash off emails, tell stories, and express opinions. You have the experience, you just don't know it. Think about all the positives. Repeat the I cans to yourself and abolish the I can't from your vocabulary. Yes, you can write this admissions essay. Yes, you can finish a dozen chocolate chip muffins in one sitting. Perspective is everything, and the right attitude goes a long way. Get inspired. Pouring over dozens of sample college admissions essays immediately before sitting down to write your own can be a debilitating exercise, because you may feel compelled to compare your earliest ideas to these final polished essays. That doesn't seem fair. Don't do it. However, we do recommend you read through some general personal essays to direct your brain towards the style of the personal narrative— start to look for writing you admire that is executed in the first person. Essays or memoirs by authors like David Sedaris, Trevor Noah, 
Roxanne Gay and Tina Fey are good places to start. Mark Twain said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. E.L. Doctorow said, writing is an exploration. You start from nothing and learn as you go. And who could forget the essential perspective of that humanoid robot who said, I'll be back with my red pen to select and refine my best ideas after I've gotten them all on the page. Free writing is, at its core, just as it sounds, the act of writing freely. It is the exercise of jotting down whatever comes to mind without judgment or worrying about the final product. Its purpose is to get your stream of consciousness thoughts on the page while training you to trust your gut and write your brains out. Or trust your brain and write your guts out. Don't stress, just write. The step in the essay process that feels the messiest is also the step that sets you up for success. The blank page portion of the process is always the most terrifying, but the more you write, the more you will have to consider when you pull together your more cohesive drafts. The deeper you dig, the greater chance you have of unearthing the hidden gems buried in the deepest layers of your memory. Your essay is already up there, but the components are scattered, and initially it may be hard to distinguish the keepers from the fool's gold. So keep everything and keep going. Experiment. Write down all of your craziest ideas because at the end of the day, even diamonds need to be cut. Another beautiful side effect of free writing is that it helps you build up what we like to call college essay endurance. The brain is a muscle, and storytelling is a skill that often doesn't turn on with the flip of a switch. You need to exercise this function of your brain regularly. We've said it before, and we'll say it again. Start early. One of the largest misconceptions about free writing is that your efforts should be focused on covering a wide breadth of material without digging too deep into any one subject, or that you should mine down to the core of a few specific elements of your story, focusing on uncovering small details related to the very specific pathways you've chosen. But the most effective free writes cover both aspects, the breadth and the depth, which is why we encourage you to do what we call the drill around, drill down. First, think about your topic in all its majestic glory. What possible anecdotes might be included in your explorations of that topic? If you're an engineer who once attended an inventor's fair with your older brother, what led you to that event? How long have you been interested in making things? What are some of your favorite creations, and how did you come up with each idea? What final lessons might you learn or conclusions might you come to based on your interest in invention? Jot down some notes on each of these subjects, leaving space to fill in details later. This is the drill around. Once you have excavated the surface and noticed some glittery potential essay ideas, it's time to transition to the drill down. In this stage, follow your most promising ideas and interesting tangents as far as they will go. If you're our engineer friend, choose your favorite invention. Maybe it was an essay writing robot. Where did the idea for this creation come from? How long did it take you to plan out your project? And did anyone help you along the way? Where did you get the parts to build your robot? What other challenges did you experience? Dive into each subject head first, recording every detail you can think of. Nothing is too minute or too unimportant to get down. Forget minimalism. More is more. It may feel like you're veering off course as you delve into a side note to your main story, but these divergences are often the source of unexpected and compelling details. Following your train of thought about your grandfather's immigration experience could lead to a memory of a weird book about underwater animals that taught you how to speak English. Be as descriptive as you can and don't worry about overdoing it. You can always scrap what doesn't work. As you start to dig into this process, you may find drilling around and down for golden nuggets isn't as easy as you expected. Here are a few guidelines to help you effectively execute your excavation. Just write. Even if you're not in the mood, even if you don't think you'll like what's coming out on the page, even if you hate everything you're writing that day, just freaking write. If your thoughts don't come out the way you want them to, bold them. Put them in parentheses. Make a small notation that indicates you may want to circle back and revise. If you don't know what to write about, start jotting down a description of your day so far. Just don't stop the forward motion. 
At this phase in the process, bad writing is not your enemy. Your enemy is the blank page. Don't write. Maybe writing isn't your favorite way to express yourself. Perhaps you're more of an artist, or you prefer to just talk for hours. When setting words down on the page poses an obstacle, don't forego the free write. Go around it. If you suddenly feel the urge to draw, sketch it out. Make a diagram or an idea map. If you think you're a better talker than a writer, record yourself telling your story to a friend and then transcribe what you said. Tell it a few times and observe which details you add and subtract. Do whatever it takes to keep telling your story. Forget spelling and grammar for now. Attention to details like grammar and spelling is essential to the final draft of your essay. But now is not the time to be orally fussy. Don't stop your flow to check the spelling of Massachusetts or look up the rules for dangling modifiers. You don't even have to write in fully fleshed out paragraphs if they aren't coming naturally in the moment. For now, we give you license not to care. Though please, for the love of English teachers around the world, try to use your and your correctly if you can. No judgments. This is similar to the rule we spoke about in Chapter 3. You are absolutely not allowed to judge your first attempts. No backtracking. Do not reread the sentence you just wrote to see if you like it. Don't think about whether or not you're going in the right direction. Don't look back. Just keep swimming. Don't stop believing. Just freaking write. Or draw. Or talk. Interpretive dance if you have to. Only you know the best way to get your thoughts out of your brain and into the world. Ask for questions. Tell a close friend or family member you trust about your topic and ask him or her to assign you a set of quick interview questions. If this person read an essay about your topic, written by you, what would they want to know? Free writing in response to bite-sized prompts is a great way to inspire a new flood of ideas and break through initial free writing trepidation. Make sure to request that whoever asks these questions challenges you to dig for details. You are trying to tell a vivid story that stays interesting for the length of an entire essay. If, for example, you're Grayson writing about your journey through the intimidating world of improv comedy, maybe your mom will ask you about your scariest attempt at coming up with an idea off the cuff. Perhaps she'll ask you what random character you enjoyed playing the most and how you decide what kinds of details you will try to bring to a new scene. Why is improv scarier than a presentation at the front of the classroom? Getting a new perspective in the mix will pose many questions you may not have thought to ask yourself. Identify the highlights, but delete nothing. Of course you are going to want to review your free rights and start wrangling your best work, but try not to do this until you have at least double the number of words required for any given assignment. We also recommend sitting down to free write at least three times before you start to sift through your results. Remember, it is much easier to snip and trim away from an essay that is too long than it is to add to one that isn't fully fleshed out. That said, when you do begin to review and isolate your best efforts, always save a copy of your initial free writes. Don't trash your extra words for good. You will regret it. Writing the college essay is stressful enough. You don't want to have to do the mental version of dumpster diving for former drafts. Forget the empty trash button even exists. Keep an initial copy of all your free writes saved at least until submission day. Who knows, maybe one day you may even want to read through those initial free writes just for fun. Our favorite Saturday night activity. Once you have thoroughly excavated your brain and mined your memory, how do you decide which elements belong in your personal essay? What separates the good from the bad? Mostly, it comes down to finding big patterns and plucking gems. Finding big patterns. When you begin to dig into your free rights, the first thing you want to do is look for overlap in content. What themes come up over and over again? Is there a specific challenge you describe multiple times? Do you find yourself writing about various aspects of the same small event? Is there a metaphor that repeats itself in various incarnations? Look for the interplay between the answers to questions posed by your free write interviewer. How do your responses play off each other? Highlight anything that feels important. We're not being metaphorical here. Physically, highlight the patterns in your document using the highlight tool, or an actual neon yellow marker if you're one of those retro types. Choose a color and stick with it. You'll need another one for the next step in the process, so don't go getting all double rainbowy on your document for no reason. 
At least not yet. Once you start to identify the patterns in your thought process, you will likely realize that, without even trying, you are already pushing your story in its most authentic direction. Next, it's time to scope out the gems. Sure, it is important to identify the big picture direction of your essay, but effective storytelling is often about the power of small moments and the details you identify in your free rights will help you bring your story to life. The description of your mother's hands or the sound of the ignition the first time you drove a car are often the kinds of details that will stick with your reader. Make these phrases and descriptions easily identifiable using your second highlight color. Mine your free rights for the descriptions that sing, the sentences you instantly fall in love with, the chunks of writing that actually make you proud upon first read. While much of free writing results in unusable gobbledygook, the process is bound to result in a few sparkling phrases, and many more that could ultimately shine like diamonds with a little polishing. We'll bet you'll find more gems to covet than you initially expect. Okay. So you have drilled and drilled until your fingers could tap no more and your noggin was verifiably empty. You have thousands of words on the page and you have color-coded your best material for building out the big picture and filling in the meaningful details. Now what? Like any great adventurer with his or her eye on the prize, you're going to track down a map to follow. Actually, you're going to create one for yourself out of thin air because you're a freaking magician. Laying out a simple outline will make it easier to see the full trajectory of your story. It will identify holes that need to be filled and story points that need further developing. Crafting an outline at this stage in the game will also help verify that you have chosen a topic that is strong enough to support an entire essay. Not to mention that the outline will help organize the logical flow to ensure that admissions officers remember your most important points. Luckily for you, We don't believe you need a super detailed 14-page long Roman numeral catalog to chart your path forward. We're talking about slapping together a lightning-fast, 16-line, broad-stroke guide to your new master plan. And all that needs to go into it are big-picture headers and supporting subtopics for each paragraph. You should already have a pretty good idea of what these themes and supports will be by now, as they've been rolling around in your brain during brainstorming and free writing. And if you put enough time into your free rights, your illuminating details should be pretty easy to fill in. Just because you make an outline doesn't mean your plan won't change. In fact, we expect a bit of tweaking to occur as you explore potential story structures and framing devices in the next chapter. Still, following a trail that you adjust along the way is much easier than plucking from an amorphous cloud of ideas, even your best ones. Good storytelling is a function of a great idea excellent planning, and thoughtful story flow, which we will cover in the next chapter as well. It is always easier to navigate your way to a story with a roadmap in front of you. Once you have a pile of free rights and a lovingly constructed outline, it's time to explore some different methods of storytelling and pull together the first draft of your amazing college admissions essay. But for now, dive into a bowl of delicious alphabet soup. You are a free writing expert. Before we move on to storytelling, let's take a look at the third of Grayson's essays in which he stands up for a friend. What kinds of details does Grayson highlight about this experience? What do we learn about his character? We now present Grayson as the activist. It was love at first nap. The first time I curled up next to Franklin, I was six weeks old, recently adopted from a local shelter with my mother and three sisters. In the world beyond the cage, everything was new and full of wonder. Sunlight streamed in through the open window, food tasted freshly uncanned, and a giant sheepdog with a sticky tongue and wagging tail was inviting as a pillow and a friend. My whole family warmed to this walking shag carpet, but there was a special bond between me and Frank, as he would come to be known. We were both curious and silly at heart and conducted experiments throughout the house. Would the humans notice if we hid the water bowls? They would. Would my entire head fit inside Frank's mouth? It did. We tackled larger projects, Frank pulling toilet paper off its roll before I rendered it useless with my expert tangling skills. As we got older, we confided in each other about goals for the future, mine to become a lawyer fighting for animal rights and Frank's to run a successful advertising firm. We encouraged each other's dreams and allayed each other's fears. It wasn't until my first week at cat prep that I realized my feelings toward canine companions were not shared by all my teenage compatriots. 
a cranky Scottish fold named Badger made fun of me after he saw a picture of Frank on my phone. Dog lover, he yelled, snickering with his friends. The next day, I couldn't walk the halls without hearing whispers of dog walker or pooper scooper hissed in my direction. It was enough to make a cat cry. In the back of my mind was the memory of the time Frank first encouraged me to climb a tree, positioning his fluffy frame underneath the sprawling maple in case he needed to catch me. Dog or cat or anteater, is there any better definition of a true friend? By lunchtime, I was sick of the cat scratches. I pulled a sheet of paper out of my notebook and quickly pawed out a sign. First meeting of the Cat-Dog Alliance tomorrow at 4 p.m. in the cafeteria. Cats, canines, and other furry friends are welcome. I stuck it to the cafeteria bulletin board and held my head high as I scurried off to class. The next afternoon, Frank and I sat together in the cafeteria, worried no one else would show. Just then, two tabbies named Chester and Cher and a skittish, exotic short hair named Margaret Thatcher padded into the room. Cher admitted that she had always felt a kinship with the beagle next door. Chester told me he never had the opportunity to play with dogs, but had always wanted to expand his circle to include other species. Before I could check on Margaret Thatcher, she was extending her tiny paw to Frank, all fear removed from her characteristically nervous facade. Thus, the first meeting of the Cat-Dog Alliance, CDA, began. Frank mentioned the meetings at Bark Academy and we grew to over 50 members, a healthy mix of breeds and species. I began to receive messages from animals in other towns and states who wanted to join or start branches of their own. I applied for the CDA national license in 2012. And three years later, there are over 40 branches worldwide. Every year we host a national convention promoting interspecies tolerance, which has been attended by cats, dogs, birds, squirrels, and even a manatee. That was quite an ordeal, but meeting Shannon was worth it. We have all learned to find strength in our similarities and unity in our differences. At the end of the day, we're all animals with a need for connection. I do not regret standing up for my right to be a dog lover. Why would a cat want to be anything else?